coming to our last program in the Civil War 150 series. It's crazy because it's gone so quickly and it's been so well received and we're so happy that you're all here. The lights are driving me crazy, so I'm going to move over here. Um, so I'm Darlene Hurd. I'm one of the librarians at the Temple of Knowledge, otherwise known as the library. And Brent Roberts, our library director, has supported these programs.
This evening we'll be performing music that is generically representative of the music of the Civil War of the day. And as such, it's generically representative of what would have been heard on both sides of the conflict. The collection of music that we're playing from was published in 1854. It was music arranged specifically for a brass band. All the instruments in the band were made of brass. And we'll talk a lot more about how that didn't start out in the brass in the band tradition. But for now, everything we're doing is for brass band. So the instrumentation you see before you is essentially what they would have been using in the day. Except for the number of players. There would have been three or four B-flat trumpet players. There would have been a bunch of horn players. It wouldn't have been the modern French horn player. There would have been one or two drummers, two or three, what was that thing? <laughs> tubas. There would have been two or three tubas and two or three trombones. There would, however, have been only one poor, lonely E-flat cornet player. And the reason for that is the instrument was fairly difficult to play, and it was given very high intricate parts to play and kind of led the band at the time. Um, as long as I'm introducing the people in the group, Aaron is here. Okay. I'm introducing the group. Okay. All seriousness, this is Aaron Roberts on trumpet. Aaron is the band director at Skyview High School. Next to him is Mary Robertson. Mary is a clinical, is a clinical coordinator at Billings Clinic and a member of the Billings Symphony. Brad Edwards is our very fine percussionist. Um, some of you might have seen him around town playing with several jazz groups, but he is also the lead percussionist for, what is the name of that Scottish ensemble? Uh, Caledonia Pipe and Drum. The Caledonia Pipe and Drum Band. So when we brought him in on this project, it lent an air of authenticity to what we're doing <laughs> that just really elevated um, what we're doing tonight, and it was a, I, he kind of joined us at the last minute, and Brad, thank you very much for being here. On to it is Lakota Stahl. He is one of our students here in the music program, and very proud to have him playing with us tonight. Um, last but not least, our new low brass teacher and jazz band instructor, this is John Roberts. Uh, native of Malta, and actually graduated from this institution. Uh, about <clears throat> years ago, <laughs> has been living in California, and we are indeed very fortunate to have him back here uh, at this institution. So uh, I'll press on with the discussion of the instruments. I want to talk about the brass instruments in this E flat coronet um, specifically. This is actually a trumpet. If you hold it up next to this one, thank you. You can see that the tube, well, no, you can't because I'm holding it the wrong way. The tubing on this one comes all the way down past my hand, and is thus, this is about six feet of tubing in all. This one is much shorter, so it plays a higher note on its, what we call, fundamental pitch. All of these brass instruments started out in, a, in the 1500s and the 1600s, only having the capacity to play about a half a dozen notes. They essentially were glorified bugles and they were used for signaling. Just before the Civil War started, the idea of taking a trumpet like device and turning it into something that could play all 12 of the notes was a fairly startling invention. It actually took place in Europe right before the beginning of the 18th century with um, Adolf Sax, who you've all heard of the saxophone. Before he, had, uh, before he started slumming and invented that instrument, <laughs> <laughs> he took a bugle, a bugle-like device, and he actually cut holes all through it in various places and covered those holes with little pads and a lever system so that the player would hold it like this and open and close the holes. Now it allowed them to get all 12 notes, but the problem was is some of the notes would come out here and some of them would come out a little hole back here. So when you were playing, it 
some notes were really loud, some notes were really soft. It was very disconcerting to listen to. But it did turn into a virtuoso instrument, and it was the real basis for these bands in the Civil War that were going to start cropping up. In 1856, there was a giant playoff between the world's best key bugle player and a guy playing a cornet that actually had valves in it. Now, the valves in it weren't like the piston valves that go up and down on this instrument. If Mary could quickly show the French horn and wiggle her valves, those are called rotary valves, because when she pushes, no, you hold it. I'm afraid of it. <laughs> when she pushes a valve down in these sections here, there's a thing that spins sideways, and that redirects the air through the, the various slides of the instrument. And in the process of doing that, allows them to change notes. Well, anyway, in 1856, Ned Kendall, the world's greatest key bugle player, and Patrick Gilmore. How many people here have ever heard of the Gilmore Band? <laughs> Mr. Gilmore, you promised me you'd be here. Okay, how many people have heard of John Philip Sousa? Okay, just prior to Sousa, and I mean just prior, their, their lifetimes overlap. Gilmore founded a band. When he was a really young man, he was a hot trumpet player. And he played this new invention that had the regular valves on it. And he actually won the competition between the two guys, at which point it was readily apparent to everybody who made instruments and played instruments that the new valve apparatuses, apparati, the new valve instruments were going to be instruments that would be easy to manufacture and ready, readily disseminated throughout the world, throughout the country. Because they could play faster and cleaner. This opened the door for this big wave of instruments to be produced. This wave of new brass instruments happened less than 10 years before the beginning of the Civil War. So you can see where this is going to end up. When they started needing tons of musicians for the war effort, it was easy to produce the instruments, and they would have a sound that would carry and project outdoors when they needed to be. The next piece we're going to play, the prima donna waltz. The prima donna is the E-flat instrument. It's not the player, mind you. No, seriously, it's not. It's the instrument. This was considered, the E-flat instrument was a very, very showy instrument. Coincidentally enough, this is probably the easiest piece I have to play on the whole program. Why it's called the prima donna waltz, I'm not really sure. It does have some high notes in it, but compared to some of the other stuff that's coming later, this is a fairly accessible piece for the E-flat instrument. Dancing is allowed, by the way, so should anybody feel the urge to waltz? <laughs> Authentic Civil War me. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 